Okay, thanks so much. So um, I am Lauren Groner. I am uh, Dr. Waite's uh, co-pilot in this whole endeavor, and, along with Dr. Reed. So um, I am very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rishikesh Dalal. Dr. Dalal is a clinical assistant professor of medicine in the Division of uh, General Internal Medicine at Weill Cornell. Uh, just this month, he started a new position as Vice President and Accountable Care Organization Physician Executive for uh, CVS Accountable Care. Uh, Dr. Dalal earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard University, his medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis, and his Master's of, in Public Health um, in Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. He uh, trained in internal medicine at NYU in Bellevue. Um, and later trained in preventive medicine at Stony Brook University um, uh, Hospital. So aside from being a primary care physician, Dr. Dalal also holds certificates in obesity medicine, HIV medicine, and addiction medicine. He practices at Community Healthcare Network, uh, which is a, a network of 14 ambulatory centers across New York City, uh, for which he served as medical director for five years. Uh, before taking that position at CHN, Dr. Dalal served as the medical director of physician services at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, Dr. Dalal has a particular interest in cancer screening uh, in the ambulatory care setting and is a collaborator on um, the Dalio Center for Health Justice funded research study, I Breathe, uh, which I am the, the PI of, um, and that's focused on addressing barriers to lung cancer screening in primary care. He advises residents and attendings on completing quality improvement um, and uh, research initiatives and is a peer reviewer for the New England Journal of Medicine. Please help me welcome Dr. Rishikesh Jalal to the podium uh, for his talk entitled Incorporating Lung Cancer Screening into Clinical Practice, a Clinician's Perspective. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Dr. Groner. Uh, very, uh, so delighted to be invited to present today on <clears throat> the topic of incorporating lung cancer screening into practice. And you know, as a primary care physician, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to address lung cancer screening as a topic in a very busy uh, primary care visit. And <clears throat> when I talk to my primary care colleagues, um, what I find very surprising is <clears throat> the significant uh, gap in knowledge that persists among primary care physicians about the high incidence of lung cancer mortality uh, in the U.S. and therefore the opportunity that screening presents to really improve the lives of our patients. So with that, let me uh, just go through the uh, briefly the agenda for today. We'll look at the incidence and mortality of lung cancer, uh, the evidence for screening, and despite the strong evidence, we have low screening rates uh, around the country, uh, understanding barriers <clears throat> and really discussing ways to motivate both clinicians as well as patients. We'll look at shared decision making, we'll look at EHR templates to make things easier, uh, knowing exactly which ICD-10 codes and CPT codes to use. Uh, smoking cessation counseling is an essential part uh, since a lot of our folks uh, continue to smoke. And then future directions in uh, lung cancer screening. So here are some lung cancer uh, statistics for 2024, the American Cancer Society. This year, we will have around 234,000 new cases of lung cancer in the U.S. That's, this basically boils down to a new case of lung cancer every two minutes in the U.S. It's a staggering figure. Lifetime risk ranges from 1 to 15, or 1 out of 17 individuals um, will develop lung cancer in their lifetime. And we'll have 125,000 deaths from lung cancer this year. So this is lung cancer mortality. Uh, as been stated previously, uh, lung cancer remains the most common cause of uh, cancer death in the U.S. in both men and women, representing more than one out of five cancer deaths. This is stage of diagnosis and five-year survival. So this really highlights the critical importance of uh, early detection of lung cancer. Nearly half of lung cancers are uh, identified at a, a later stage. And uh, out of the 46% of such cancers, only, there's only a 6% five-year survival. Meanwhile, when lung cancer is identified early, 
uh, around 24% of such cancers, uh, we have a 60% five-year survival. So it's really critical to encourage screening to identify cancers early. This is the uh, schematic of the National Lung Screening Trial. Uh, it's been discussed earlier. Uh, really forms the foundation of the evidence we have uh, recommending screening. Uh, 54,000 patients were enrolled uh, between 2002 through 2009 in this study in 33 centers across the U.S. Uh, patients were age 55 to 74 and were at high risk for lung cancer. They were randomized to receive either three annual low-dose CT scans or three annual chest X-rays. Now, the outcomes of this study were groundbreaking. They found that uh, low-dose CT identified more lung cancers. There was a 20% lung cancer mortality reduction and also a 7% reduction in all-cause mortality. This is very uh, significant evidence in support of low dose CT scan. <clears throat> this shows the, uh, the uh, stage of diagnosis for um, basically what this highlights really is that when lung cancer is, is identified through low dose CT, 52% are a stage 1A. This is where the five year survival is 60%. Meanwhile, if no screening is done or if they only receive chest x-rays, more of the cancers are identified at a later stage. So based on the National Lung Screening Trial, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force issued their recommendation around 2013-2014 um, that recommended screening between the ages of 55 and 80 with more than 30 pack years of smoking history. Patients needed to currently smoke or quit within the last 15 years. Now, subsequent to that recommendation, it became apparent <clears throat> that many patients uh, who were at high risk of developing lung cancer were actually being left out of those guidelines, the eligibility guidelines. So more data was evaluated. And there was three main uh, sources of information that the Preventative Services Task Force looked at. One was the Nelson trial, which took place in Europe which enrolled patients as young as 50. There was a Southern Community Cohort Study that uh, looked at patients attending health centers throughout the South and included more women and African Americans, and also CISNET modeling, essentially identified that uh, by increasing the uh, eligibility down to the age of 50 with more than 20 pack years instead of 30, we can include more African-American patients, as well as women, in eligibility for lung cancer screening. Because these groups may develop lung cancer with lower exposure to smoking. Despite these recommendations, uh, screening rates vary significantly throughout the country. Now, lung cancer screening was implemented around 2015. All health plans, Medicare, Medicaid, Despite that, this is around, I think, 2022 data. Uh, in California, only around 1% of screening eligible patients actually get screened and goes up to 16, 17% of eligible patients in Massachusetts. New York is somewhere in the middle, around 5%, some say up to 6% of patients at high risk getting screened, which is around the national average. A huge opportunity. So here are uh, some of the challenges facing primary care clinicians in daily practice. First of all, we, uh, patients who are eligible for lung cancer screening typically have multiple comorbidities. Um, so there's uh, typically competing priorities in terms of their health care. Uh, uh, there's lack of awareness of the guidelines. There's skepticism regarding the evidence. Uh, there's access challenges for patients. There's concerns about cost um, and insurance coverage. There's uh, concern about potentially radiation exposure. There's uh, difficulty with accurately calculating pack year smoking. Uh, a lot of EHRs don't collect this information routinely. Um, then uh, 
physicians have just anxiety about managing abnormal results and <clears throat> the daunting prospect of conducting shared decision making in a busy office visit. So this is number needed to screen. I think this highlights the fact that screening for lung cancer <clears throat> is just as effective as screening for other cancers. Um, just three annual low dose CTs, screening 320 patients can save one life from lung cancer death. Meanwhile, for colon cancer, it requires three colonoscopies spaced 10 years apart. Um, 300, one out of 350 patients will be saved. For breast cancer, it's five biannual mammograms in a woman's uh, 50s that can save uh, one out of 350 women. So the number needed to screen for lung cancer is pretty significant and impressive when it only takes three annual screenings to achieve this level. Now, when patients get screened for longer, we can imagine that the number needed to screen would be even lower to save one life. So false positives are a concern. Now the radiologists in the room may have more uh, tangible experience with this, but uh, false positives, are, you know, folks are concerned about subsequent imaging. So what is a false positive? It's the proportion of those screened undergoing additional imaging or intervention that does not lead to a diagnosis of cancer, okay? What I tell my patients is you may have a 20, 25% chance um, of getting a subsequent scan less than a year later, okay? Uh, based on, uh, it varies based on center. It can range from about 8% to 49%. Um, <clears throat> the intervention rates are much lower, about half a percent to 2.4%. Um, things do improve with the subsequent scans. Uh, fewer, what we call false positives and um, around the same amount of interventions. I would say, Compared to mammography, this is actually pretty favorable. I know a lot of my patients are routinely called back for uh, additional imaging, ultrasounds. Uh, about 10% will get biopsies with any given uh, mammography screening year. So, uh, so compared to that, uh, the LODO CT is, uh, is, is actually a pretty favorable test. Of course, patients have a lot of concerns about uh, screening. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of shame and stigma regarding smoking risk. Uh, a lot of patients are not ready to acknowledge the risk that smoking poses to their overall health. So they may not agree to proceed with lung cancer screening. There's a concern about cost. Uh, they have other health priorities, so the concerns are certainly overlapping with the clinicians. There's a fear of cancer diagnosis, the fear of the unknown, a fear of cancer treatment. Um, there's concern about radiation exposure. So a lot of these concerns that patients have. So what, are, what can we do? How can we encourage clinicians to encourage lung cancer screening? How can we encourage patients to accept it? I think it starts with provider education, number one. So reiterating the evidence for it, talking about how to communicate with patients, and then engaging patients generally. You have to engage the community, those folks that are high risk, so that they're aware that lung cancer screening is actually a thing. So they can, they can talk with their doctors, ask about it, and hopefully get to a, get to a place where they can get screened. Pack your calculators uh, are super helpful when you can find them, and I'll tell you one place where you can find it. Um, these are not often in the EHR, but including fields in the EHR that capture this information will help identify eligible patients. We'll look at some EHR tools, templates, uh, that can provide appropriate documentation, and we'll look at the correct ICD-10 and CPT codes to use so that the scan is approved by the health plan. And navigation support, so critical, um, is, can be a game changer for practices incorporating lung cancer screening. I won't go into this in more detail because I think there's another speaker coming after me that talks about navigation. So I love this website, it's shouldiscreen.com. Um, <clears throat> this actually provides the nuanced lung cancer risk for patients. This is based on the National Lung Screening Trial data. Uh, it includes not just age and smoking history, but also gender, race, ethnicity, BMI, 
family history, history of other cancers, COPD. All of this is, is a, just a brief questionnaire on the website, and the patient can get a uh, personalized risk for developing lung cancer over the next six years. So this is just two screenshots. The person on the left is intermediate risk, and the person on the right is a high-risk patient. The person on the right is noted to have a lung cancer risk of 26% in the next six years. And at the bottom, you'll see that uh, a notation here, compared to other people like you, there will be 53 fewer deaths out of 1,000 in the next six years if you get screened. So looking at things like this can be powerfully motivating for the, for the patient as well as the provider to encourage lung cancer screening. So how do, we, how do we communicate with patients about what is the, what is the screening like? It's actually a very easy scan. Um, first of all, the patient's going to check in. Uh, there's no clothing change, no needles. It's painless. The patient lies down on the scanning table, and while they're going through the machine, they hold their breath for about six seconds or so. Overall, the scan takes less than two minutes. So very easy to complete, and compared to mammography, colonoscopy, it's light years easier and should not be a deterrent to screening. Shared decision making, this is daunting for clinicians. The AHRQ produced uh, a couple of visual guides that can help patients understand their potential uh, risk for having additional imaging, uh, on, which is shown on the, um, the left, the, the possibility of biopsies. Um, the, the graphic on the right shows how much radiation is experienced from a low-dose CT, which is around 1.4 millisieverts, which is just one-fifth that of a diagnostic CT and about three times that of a mammogram, to put it in context. So this is a uh, EHR tool, a template for the chart. It can either be copy-pasted or brought in with a smart phrase. Um, the top part of this template includes the eligibility criteria. The bottom part of this template includes the um, just documenting um, shared decision making. The top part, just zooming in on that a little bit, just confirms the age, smoking status, the quit time, uh, pack years. <clears throat> and remember, the patient should not have symptoms of lung cancer. And uh, this just goes on to say that they, they meet eligibility. I would note that uh, CMS does have a recommendation um, of screening up to age 77. This is based on a national lung screening trial data where patients were enrolled up to age 74. And if you include three annual LOTO CTs, that takes you to age 77. <clears throat> so this is the, um, <clears throat> the verbiage for the shared decision making. Just go over, uh, goes through the, um, the, the, the benefits of screening, the potential harms of screening, um, that uh, smoking cessation counseling was provided. So I won't read through all this, but this is very helpful. Now, what are the diagnostic codes to select? And this is critical. A lot of uh, my colleagues find that health plans seem to deny the studies that they're requesting. <clears throat> I think, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the safest diagnostic codes to put in the chart when you're ordering the your loader CT. You can choose either the F17.2, F17.21, nicotine dependence, or a relatively newer code, um, Z87.891, which is the personal history of nicotine dependence. This is going to give your best chance to get approved by your health plan. Um, a code not to use is Z12.2, screening for malignant neoplasm of respiratory organs. Um, this, for whatever reason, is not considered adequate for some health plans to get coverage. So the CPT codes, these are usually built into the EHR for the, um, the initial or annual low-dose CT, 71271. <clears throat> Optional, you can also add in the G codes, G0296, and the um, smoking cessation counseling, depending on how long you spend with the patient, the 994 codes down below. So lungcheck.org, this is a, a website created by Dr. Lauren Groner and colleagues at Wild Cornell. Uh, it's a wonderful website, uh, provides a lot of the resources um, I went through earlier. <clears throat> it also has a very nifty uh, pack your calculator, which acknowledges that the patient may start and stop smoking throughout their lives. They may smoke different amounts during those periods of time. It helps you calculate 
uh, pack here is very accurately. So I highly recommend you check that out. And while we're at it, we definitely need to look at smoking cessation <clears throat> when we're talking about lung cancer screening. Around 75% of patients getting lung cancer screening are current smokers. So this is a great opportunity to discuss with them, hey, if you're getting screened for lung cancer, if you're, agreed to, if you're agreeing to that, you may also agree to take a quit date. You may agree to medication treatment. <clears throat> And at addiction, as an addiction medicine specialist, I will also uh, <clears throat> advise looking into some of these FDA-approved medications, of which there are several. Nicotine replacement therapy is wonderful. Um, it comes in three different formulations. Transdermal patch, nicotine gum, nicotine lozenge. Bupropion is also approved. It's also known as Wellbutrin. The 12-hour formulation is approved for smoking cessation, uh, but you can use off-label the 24-hour once-a-day formulation. Uh, Varenicline or Chantix uh, can also be extremely beneficial for patients. Um, there is a starting month pack that helps uh, the patient ramp up their dose uh, throughout the first month. And then after that, they could use the continuing month pack. So this is combination therapy. Lung cancer screening, <clears throat> sorry, lung cancer, uh, sorry, smoking cessation. Um, is often achieved best through combination therapy. So I always recommend usually a combination of two different <clears throat> medications. Either you combine two different types of nicotine replacement, or you can combine varenicline with nicotine replacement, varenicline plus bupropion, or bupropion plus nicotine replacement. I've used each, each one of these combinations for different patients with success. In the last couple minutes of the talk, I'm just gonna mention <clears throat> future trends in lung cancer screening. Uh, there is a lot of influence now in healthcare and in other industries with AI, machine learning, predictive modeling to really help us do what we do better. Um, in terms of lung cancer screening, what we wanna do is to be able to target our efforts towards the highest risk patients. We wanna be able to reduce those false positive rates. Uh, one way to do this is to look at um, scans through um, uh, uh, machine learning, and one research group at Mass General Hospital and MIT uh, did just this. They looked at a total of around 20, 26,000 low-dose CTs from three institutions, uh, the uh, MGH, Changwe Memorial Hospital, and then overall the NLST, um, and then basically it can predict the individual's future lung cancer risk from a single LDCT. Pretty amazing work. Um, this just shows the receiver operating characteristics, uh, basically showing relatively high sensitivity and specificity for uh, predicting a future lung cancer risk up to six years in advance. Uh, biomarkers is another huge uh, hot topic of research in cancer screening. Uh, for uh, lung cancer, uh, there's been a few different efforts. Uh, one is uh, the study I'm highlighting here, which looks at microRNA, um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to basically uh, combine low-dose CT uh, imaging with biomarker evaluation to further risk stratify uh, patient uh, results. Uh, and in this particular study, um, a positive LDCT with a positive biomarker increased the positive likelihood for lung cancer from five up to 18 and reduce the low, uh, negative likelihood from 0.29 down to 0.03. So very impressive um, future trends in this space. And with that, I will stop there. Thank you all so much. OK, thank you so much, Dr. Dalal. That was wonderful. Our next speaker is Dr. Kirthana Kesheva. She is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell and an attending physician and director of interventional pulmonology at Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. Dr. Kesheva earned her MBBS and her MS in Bangalore, India, and then completed her internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Queens, followed by fellowships in critical care medicine and pulmonary critical care 
Medicine at Geisinger Medical Center and New York Presbyterian um, Brooklyn Methodist Hospital, respectively. She uh, subsequently stayed on as faculty at BMH, where she has been recognized multiple years in a row for her excellence in teaching. And in addition, uh, Dr. Kasheva chairs the Bronchoscopy Quality Improvement Committee um, at NYP Brooklyn Methodist and is an active member of the Lung Cancer Screening and Critical Care Committees. Over the past three years, I have been fortunate enough to work with her and get to know Dr. Kasheva as a fantastic colleague, a teacher, a physician. And so today, I'm thrilled that she'll be sharing her expertise in clinical management of screen detected nodules. So please help me welcome Dr. Kasheva to the podium. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I mean, uh, listening to the speakers today, I feel humbled to be here and definitely uh, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical management of lung nodules. Um, I'm thinking a lot of people here are either in public health or radiology, so uh, I won't be talking too much about uh, transthoracic needle aspiration, um, just a little bit, and then, I mean, uh, our excellent colleagues here probably have more insight into it. Um, I do consult for AstraZeneca, but nothing to do with this talk. Um, so the learning objectives for today, we will be talking about some clinical decision-making tools, but I think Dr. Dalal already touched on that, so I'm not going to spend too much time there. Uh, a pre-lunch meeting is always a bit of a rush because, you know, everyone's hungry. Um, I'll talk about peripheral and robotic bronchoscopy. That's where my interest lies in, especially in relation to this topic. Um, and the supplementary navigational modalities, which is endobronchial ultrasound, electromagnetic navigation, and cone beam CTs, and how they assist in help improve uh, tissue diagnostics. Uh, we've already been through enough slides about uh, lung cancer statistics. Uh, just to reiterate, 25% of all cancer-related deaths are from lung cancer and 66% of lung cancers are still diagnosed at a late stage. Um, this is the lung rats table, not trying to go through the whole thing for you. Uh, just to bring it up that, you know, if you're uh, an early uh, lung rat score, um, your estimated malignancy risk is less than 1%. And as you can see, as you go down the list, at 4B, it goes up to more than 15%, which is um, where we come in. Um, I, I put um, lung rat 3 also on the slide along with the 4A and 4B because when you see something on a scan, um, patients do want to know a little bit more information. It's, it's not as simple as us saying, hey, you know, the data shows that this could be, uh, the, the likelihood of malignancy in this is low. They also want to know what it is. Why do they have it? And as data shows us that a lot of the lung nodules that's actually detected are false positives. They're really not cancer. But then again, what is it? Um, as a clinician, the first decision you have to make is whether this needs to be investigated further. Um, some, of, some of the clinical decision tools that Dr. Dalal spoke about kind of help us navigate that question for the patient. Now, when we talk about biopsies for lung, cancer, uh, uh, for lung nodules, um, traditionally there are two kinds. There is the bronchoscopic biopsies and transthoracic needle aspiration. When we talk about the TTNAs, um, this, is, uh, this was first described in 1965 for the fluoroscopic guided TTNAs. Um, obviously, things have changed since then. There is now CT guidance, ultrasound guidance, and electromagnetic navigation. Um, the rate, uh, the yield is really good when it is limited to the outer third of the lung. Um, yield is about 80 to 90 percent, and when we talk about the future of bronchoscopy, that's what we are trying to compete with. Um, the problem is the rate of um, uh, complications such as pneumothorax. You could have a new pneumothorax rate in the 17 to 33 percent. More recent studies have shown maybe in the 20 percent. Um, you have a pneumothorax, which is a lung collapse. They may need to be admitted to the hospital, may need an additional procedure, which is a chest tube placement to help the lung expand. Their duration of stay in the hospital depends for, um, on how long this pneumothorax exists uh, because they could have a prolonged air leak. Again, we are talking about patients with sick lungs. A lot of them may have emphysematous changes, which could um, cause this to extend much longer. Um, the 
disadvantage of TTNA also is that you're unable to stage the media stand uh, with this procedure. And as I said earlier, it's limited to the outer region of the lung. Um, in the more modern world, this is kind of how a TTNA is done. Uh, it is done under CT guidance. Um, going a little bit more into the bronchoscopy on the opposite end, uh, we'll go to peripheral bronchoscopy in a bit, but traditionally bronchoscopy was meant more for the central tumors. Um, when you used a regular bronchoscope, which can go down maybe two to three airway segments, um, you can, your, uh, um, the, the results of, a, 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 the ability to get a positive result in a nodule less than about two centimeters, uh, if it's in the central part, it was only about 31%. Uh, so in the periphery, it goes down to 14% when compared to what we just saw with TTNA, where you're up in the 90, uh, 80 to 90%. This led to the development of um, what we call peripheral bronchoscopy, which is all these different modalities, the ultra-thin bronchoscopies, which help us reach the peripheral areas of the lung, uh, CT-guided bronchoscopy, um, electromagnetic navigation, um, uh, EBIS, and we'll talk later about robotic bronchoscopy as well. The first in the series of advancements in terms of bronchoscopy was radial probe EBIS. Um, this was made initially available uh, in 1996. Uh, they are really tiny. Uh, it's almost like a catheter which has an ultrasound at the tip of it. It can go through the working channel of most bronchoscopes, including the ultra-thin, because they are really tiny. As you can see, the outer diameter is quite small. And this can help identify if you're in a lesion or not. Right? So, oops, sorry. Okay. So if, um, as you can see, do I have a pointer here? Sorry. Okay, so as you can see here, like this is the nodule that we are seeing. Now, when you're in the nodule, the center part of it is where your radial probe is sitting, and the um, kind of uh, homogeneous um, hypoechoic area that you, that you see right here is the nodule that you're identifying. This picture shows the radial probe going into an airway to f see that lesion. Now. Everything that we talk about has a few factors that will affect the yield. If used with a traditional bronchoscope, so a traditional bronchoscope can get you maybe into a tertiary airway at the most because of the diameter of it. Uh, the outer diameter is about six to seven, cent, uh, six to seven millimeters. Um, you can put a radial probe through it to try to get to your peripheral nodule, uh, but it still has to traverse through a very complex uh, airway tree with a lot of branching. Now, the radial probe by itself is not able to drive itself out there, right? It can get lost in the periphery. Unless you can get the radial probe into your lesion, you're not going to see the lesion. So this is just another tool that has to be taken to the right spot in the proper way. So lack of na navigation and steerability becomes a problem with the radial probe. Um, when you talk about certain locations, um, uh, Pulmonologists uh, doing a lot of procedures do hate the upper lobes. Uh, difficult to navigate in for any kind of biopsies. Um, so, uh, and especially the left upper lobe apical posterior segment has the lowest yield. The lingula and the right middle lobe, you know, direct, uh, um, um, kind of like direct streets to walk into, so that's where you have the highest yield. Um, solid lesions have a better yield than mixed or ground glass opacities. And if you have an identifi uh, identifiable leading airway, that means you're in the space, and like I said, if you're able to drive out to the lesion with a radial probe, the likelihood of you getting a diagnostic yield is higher. Okay. The ultrasound view matters as well. If you are in the center of the lesion, you're more likely to be able to biopsy it properly than if you are in an eccentric location. Uh, this is because you can't really control, once the radial probe comes out and you put your, uh, whatever you're using to biopsy through the working channel, you cannot direct where that goes. It could, even though the radial probe is here, this is an eccentric nodule, your, biops your needle may go in the opposite direction. There's no way to actually say that. But when you have a concentric location, uh, um, a concentric view, 
wherever you go, you're still going to get diagnosis. And this is the reason why the diagnostic yield when you have a, a concentric view is more than 80%, but with an eccentric view, it can go down to 30 to 50%. Uh, the next thing that came about was CT guidance for bronchoscopy. Here it provides a three-dimensional verification. There's real-time imaging to show you uh, the ne need, the probe or needle, whatever it is, in the uh, lesion of interest. Um, but it cannot help you steer the bronchoscope into the right location, especially when we're talking about the periphery. Uh, the mean radiation exposure is much higher than X-ray fluoroscopy. Uh, it can be used for pre-bronchoscopic dye marking, especially for thoracic surgeons um, with barium sulfate or indigo carmine. Uh, it also has a higher yield, probably with the ultra-thin bronchoscopes, just because you can go out to the periphery with it. Um, as you can see, again, if the size of the lesion is much smaller, obviously with uh, you can get there much easily with a CAT scan than with X-ray guidance. <coughs> the next to come on, uh, the next player on board was electromagnetic navigation. The first one to be introduced was Super Dimension, which was launched in 2004. Now, this company plus the other companies that deal with electromagnetic navigation have gone through obviously a lot of changes since 2004. But basically, think about, we've spoken about um, the uh, ca uh, ca uh, matching the bronchoscope, uh, trying to match a CT um, image of a peripheral nodule directly onto the patient, and that's what they're trying to do. There are sensors, uh, here we go, there are sensors placed on the patient. The patient is an electromagnetic navigation board, and a uh, CAT scan is performed. And with the help of electromagnetic navigation and tip sensors in the bronchoscope itself, there is a way you're able to drive and match those images as you drive into the airway to get you to the location of interest. Uh, the problem here is, and with uh, any further um, uh, developments that I speak about, including robotic bronchoscopy, the problem becomes that you are actually matching a static CAT scan with a patient that is breathing in and out. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, as I said, you know, there's an electromagnet uh, location navigation board at the bottom, and then there's improved maneuverability just because the tip of the um, instrument, the either the bronchoscope, which is what the newest uh, developments are, uh, uh, that can be tracked, or previously it used to be a device that could be a tip tracker that could be introduced through the working channel of a bronchoscope. Uh, it provides real-time location information, so it can always tell us where the tip of the bronchoscope is in, re in relation to the location of the nodule that was um, mapped on onto a CAT scan. Uh, there are different pl platforms, as I spoke about, for EMN bronchoscopy, um, and all of them pretty much have uh, similar electromagnetic navigation. Uh, either they have a field generator versus a navigation board that kind of helps drive, helps us to drive out to the lesion of interest. Now, there is also something called the bronchus sign, which means that if we see an airway going up to a lesion, we are more likely to get in there. Now, retrospective data has really not supported this, but with prospective data, there has been documentation that if you have this, the yield probably goes up from 30 to 70, uh, uh, about 80 percent. Um, the a lot of studies that involve navigational bronchoscopy and more so with robotic bronchoscopy um, has uh, the data is kind of um, limited because the developments have gone on so fast that. People are really comparing, you know, uh, institutional numbers one against the other for the most part. Or um, each person's or each group's definition of what is positive in terms of uh, findings is very different from what is positive on another study. Uh, for example, some of the initial studies that was done with either navigational bronchoscopy or robotic bronchoscopy looked at can you reach the lesion based on a CT scan? And proof could be either 
um, showing the lesion on radial ultrasound, um, either getting tissue that shows abnormal findings. That abnormal findings could be anything. Uh, it didn't necessarily mean you were going for cancer. Now, unless you have tissue, we all know with cancer, tissue is the issue. So unless you have tissue, how can you really say that that's what you're going for? Um, but again, with lung nodules, it is tricky because a lot of the lung nodules that we do see are non-malignant in nature. Okay. Nodule movement also plays an important role when it comes to biopsying. Um, if, when you look at this, remember what I initially said, everything is mapped onto a static CAT scan. Now even once the patient is moving or breathing on their own, there is enough movement in all the lobes of the lung. Uh, in the right lower lobe, it goes all the way up to 2.5 uh, centimeters. And even in the left upper lobe, which is probably the least, it's about uh, 1 to 1.1 centimeters. Now, if that nodule, if you're trying to target a nodule that's, let's say, sub-centimeter, and it moves out of your way by 1 centimeter, you are not going to get it, d despite whatever tools that you use. Right. There is some, uh, this is some of the studies that's out there looking at peripheral bronchoscopy for, uh, this is just EMN, uh, using different other modalities because in combination, the, the theory is that the, um, the yield may increase. Uh, some of these studies didn't take into account anything else. EMN was purely used. Some places did use fluoroscopy guidance. We're talking about x-ray. Um, and there was one study that used a combination of fluoroscopy plus EBUS. Um, their uh, yields are about similar, but again, you know, everyone you um, went for different size nodules um, and uh, different, um, uh, it depends on how, how peripheral that they really went for these, right? When, but most data shows that when you combine the various techniques, uh, techniques, when you combine electromagnetic navigation with radial EBUS, the um, yield goes up to about 88%. And that's really important because think about it, pre-EMN uh, and pre-radial EBUS, our um, yield for peripheral lung nodules by bronchoscopy was really down to 13%. And we are now up to about 88%. When you're talking about TTNA, which is the current standard, of, of course, if you're not taking surgery into consideration, where you're up in the 80 to 90%, right? Next came the ultra-thin bronchoscope, because the one thing we couldn't do earlier is get out into the periphery. We depended a lot on either EMN being able to take us up there, or uh, you know, a radial probe, but again, as I said, all these are super flexible, they can't really drive themselves, or you, you can't really drive them out because they don't have the stiffness to go out into the periphery. Um, the ultra-thin bronchoscopes are about 2.8 millimeters, so they can really go out really far, uh, they can go out pretty far out. Um, they can be used as an extended working channel and gives you enough uh, visualization in the peripheral airway as well. Moving on to robotic bronchoscopy, which is where all the excitement is, there are three platforms out there. The first platform was FDA approved in 2018, and this was by Oris Health, which is the Monarch. Um, soon to follow was the Ion Endoluminal by Intuitive Surg uh, Surgical in 2019, and that's the one we have currently at NYPBMH. Uh, the latest one is the Galaxy System by Noah Medical. They got their FDA approval last year. Uh, when you compare the three robotic platforms, they're all kind of similar. Um, the Monarch and the Galaxy systems use an electromagnetic navigation technology. Um, they all have proprietary technology. Um, the ion robotic bronchoscopy depends on a shape sensing uh, um, uh, uh, catheters that help navigate to the lesion. Um, the Galaxy also uses something called tilt technology, which uh, uses uh, digital tomosynthesis as they approach the nodule. So when they're within, when you're within about two centimeters to the nodule, it switches it to this uh, proprietary technology of theirs to help guide it to the end. The Monarch and the Galaxy systems um, are bronchoscopes with an end-on view, so you can continue seeing as you drive forward. Um, with the ion uh, uh, bronchoscopy, that comes out, uh, the, the catheter that's helping guide, it comes out, and so when you eventually do the biopsy, it's kind of like a bind, uh, blind biopsy or a fluoroscopy or CT guided. Okay. Um, this is uh, a Monarch. The Monarch has two robotic arms here. 
Uh, one of which is holding the bronchoscope is in place, and the other is an outer sheath to the bronchoscope. So they both travel together. They are driven by uh, remote control. So you know, if you're good at video games, this is definitely for you. Um, and the remote control is what drives it right out to the periphery. periphery. Uh, this is a CAT scan. Again, you know, uh, you have an initial CAT scan. Based on the pla a CAT scan, you have planned out approximately where it is. Um, and with the EMN software and their planning software, you're able to determine where your nodule is. And that's essentially what uh, these devices do. They drive you out to the periphery, to your nodule, based on what you've initially mapped. Um, here is the ION intuitive. Um, ION has this uh, rollerballs kind of um, control that kind of helps, again, like I said, you know, you, it helps you drive out. Basically, they're all remote control. They help you drive out to the periphery. Help, and the most important thing about all this, they're able to get you to the periphery, and they're able to stabilize it in the airway, which is where you want to be, and your hands are free to do the biopsies you need. But again, there is lack of visualization once you're out there. Okay, and this is the newest player, which is uh, the Galaxy system. Okay. Um, the advantages of these kind of uh, instruments is there is an increased accuracy of navigation and tool delivery because you're able to get out to the periphery and stay in place while you do the biopsy. The uh, pneumothorax rates are signif significantly lower with this when you compare it to TTNA, it's about 5 to 6%. The overall diagnostic yield is somewhat similar to TTNA uh, in the range of 87.6 to 88.4. Um, when this is the case, why go with robotic bronchoscopy while you can do a TTNA? Which, I mean, the minute you say robotic bronchoscopy, your initial costs have already shot up. The truth is it's all about what goes on further. With a bronchoscope, you can stage the mediastinum. With a TTNA, you cannot. You need an additional procedure. If you have about even a 20% risk of pneumothorax, and even half of them need to be admitted to the hospital, the cost can range anywhere from $13,000 to $60,000 for that admission. And you still haven't staged the mediastinum, by the way. Uh, and eventually, if imagine a stage where we get to the point where we're able to diagnose the patient we're able to stage the mediastinum, and if it's truly early stage, able to deliver airway therapeutics right in there. So by the time the patient comes out of the procedure, not only have you diagnosed that they have lung cancer, you can also say, hey, it's taken care of. You know? And that's where all of this is eventually headed. But again, you know, there are limitations to all of this. Like I said, uh, there is something called CT to body divergence, and that is because we are talking about a static image versus patient movement, and we already spoke about why there's that much variation. Um, there's a wide variation from, uh, uh, it's a huge learning curve. Um, as pulmonologists and as interventional pulmonologists, we like control of our scope. A robot driving it does not cut it for us. Uh, it takes a little while to learn and let go uh, to some extent. Um, and uh, there really aren't much stud uh, many studies um, describing procedural char characteristics and outcomes. Uh, the future directions, as I said, you know, there are newer biopsy techniques and tools uh, coming into play. Um, a lot of it is by the robotic companies itself, and so they're all proprietary, and they can't be interchangeably used. Uh, eventually, the hope is it can. Uh, there are multiple ongoing trials right now, uh, human trials right now, actually, for endobronchial ablative therapies, and that is the intention that when you come for a procedure, everything's taken care in one go. Um, and as I said, you know, it is poised to become a single procedure diagnosis, staging, and early stage cancer treatment uh, option. And with that said, uh, I have to thank Dr. Sela for this slide. Um, this is uh, by Dr. Atul Mehta, who was uh, doing a talk last year for a pro-con debate, I believe, uh, where they were talking about TTNA versus robotic bronchoscopy. And I have to agree with him. I think robotic bronchoscopy is where we're at today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Keshava. So I think we can break for lunch. Um.